It's a very great pleasure for me today to be able to introduce Thomas Abuchan, who's the, uh, well, one of four associate administrators for, for NASA, and in particular, uh, Thomas is responsible for the, the science mission director at NASA, uh, so running all the science programs. Um, as befits somebody in that position, Thomas obviously has a, a, an extremely uh, uh, outstanding uh, research career in the past, going back to his PhD uh, in Switzerland, the University of Bern, back in the early 90s, uh, where he started working with, on turbulence and, and minor solar wind ions. Uh, and he's continued that over the uh, next 20 years at a career at the University of Michigan, where he rose to the uh, rank of full professor in, I think it's space science and aerospace engineering, if I look that up correctly. Um, and in that time, of course, uh, there's been many, many research articles uh, and uh, numerous prizes. And I think also Thomas has had a particular interest in, in promoting enterprise during that time as well. I remember you being dean of enterprise or something like that at University of, of Michigan. Um, one of the things that, that, that characterized, I think, Thomas's uh, uh, research career is a significant involvement in, in building space missions. Uh, and Thomas has had involvement in uh, Ulysses, which is a mission that, that explored the outer, the, the outer solar system, the outer heliosphere. Uh, Messenger, the mission to Mercury, which is recently completed, I think, as well as has had uh, the benefit of Thomas's activity. And the, the ACE mission that, um, that's uh, monitoring the solar wind just upstream of the Earth is very important for things like space weather. And in particular, that general e experience and expertise is what uh, led to a significant link, I think, between Thomas and UCL. About 10 or 12 years ago now, Thomas was part of a team that we assembled uh, and had several meetings at MSSL and in the, in the States to put together the, the proposal for the, the solar wind analyzer uh, uh, investigation, providing three sensors for the, for the solar or, or, orbiter mission. So Thomas and the team at uh, University of Michigan have been uh, involved with UCL on that. Um, MSSL for, for UCL is, is the, the PI Institute. Um, and in fact, the, the resulting instruments that were, uh, that were put together for that were, were delivered to uh, Airbus in Stevenage uh, about a month ago. And in fact, Thomas has been to Stevenage yesterday and tells me that he's seen the instruments being attached to the spacecraft. So that, that, that's great to hear. Um, I guess in, in your current position, you're, you're in a position to, to decide whether you're still a NASA-funded co-I of the SWA investigation. But for sure, the, you're, you're still on the books as an ESA co-I. So, uh, uh, that uh, we, we have a, 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 an ongoing scientific connection. Um, so uh, over that time as well, Thomas has, has, has uh, risen in the ranks quite spectacularly. Uh, in October 2016, he was appointed to the position of assistant administrator by uh, the then NASA administrator, Charles Bolden. Um, as I said, he's back in uh, Europe for a, a couple of meetings. He's been to, to, to chat to ESA and the people at Airbus. Um, and so it's, uh, as I say, it's a very, uh, very great honor that he's here and I very much appreciate it that he's taken the time to come uh, and talk to us. Uh, and the topic of his talk uh, is entitled On the Shore of the Cosmic Ocean. Is, uh, just to give him a little token of appreciation, there's a little picture of the sun, uh, what I call the most important star. First of all, our life depends on it, but also everything we learn about other stars, we learned right here in our neighborhood, for example, that there's helium in it. Uh, we learn about uh, how the mechanisms work on the inside of that star, proved that they're really working the way they are, uh, using neutrinos and other type of emissions. And it's also an object of investigation as we go forward, uh, because there's a lot more to learn. So I wanted to give you that. Uh, hopefully you find a place in your uh, work environment and uh, with your team. Uh, to really, uh, as, a, as a sign of gratitude for everything that we have done together uh, from NASA uh, with uh, your uh, valued organization. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. I really appreciate that. So what I'm going to do is uh, give you a talk about the science program at NASA. And the way I'm going to do this is really through the eyes of an explorer who stands on Earth and recognizes that she is on the, store, on the shore of the cosmic ocean, recognizes that even though we know a lot, discovery is only beginning right now on some of the most important topics that would, questions we could be asking, questions that have been with us 
for thousands of years, questions that are at the core of our very existence, and for the first time in history, we can answer those questions with the tools of science. Because the tools of science, as we recognize, as we are wading into this shoreline, our tools of science are really powerful to open up that uh, book of uh, unknown unknowns about the uh, universe uh, that uh, is so much more interesting now than it was when I was a student. Because I remember sitting in the very uh, uh, benches that you are not at this university, somewhere else, and I remember this guy, Bonnet, Roger Bonnet, who had the equivalent job of mine in, in uh, ESA, and I remember his talk, and I thought, you know, how great is that? Uh, you know, I'm going to be able to benefit from missions like SOHO, missions like Cluster, missions that were uh, in the queue there. Of course, they have transformed my life, especially SOHO. Uh, but my message to you is opportunity is plentiful, but there are some things that we can learn from the history of discovery that I hope to elucidate as we go forward. And the way I tend to do this is really uh, as a story. So basically, I'm going to go through that. What I'm promising to do uh, is my clock over there. Uh, one of my uh, great colleagues is uh, going to make sure that I'm not going to overshoot. So we have enough time for questions. But if there's a question that something makes absolutely no sense that I'm saying or something that you'd like to have better explain, just you know, interrupt. I'm used to it. OK? <laughs> So, so basically, uh, what I'm going to do first is just give you a, an overview of, of the science program. And, and there's like multiple ways we could look at the science program. Uh, one of them is by discipline. I'm going to talk about this. But I want to talk about is by question. So the science program is driven by questions. I want to start with the one that says discovering the secrets of the universe. If it boils right down to it, the most impactful questions are the ones that are fundamental in nature and the ones that will change history. What you have in your pockets right now or on front of your desk, your iPhone, your, the, the kind of tools that you're using right now come out of investigations that are fundamental in science about how semiconductors work, how electrons exactly move in solids, how imaging uh, can work, how data are being compressed, how fill in the blank. These kind of questions, these fundamental questions, are sometimes the hardest to argue for because what we tend to do, we recognize, we tend to recognize that these questions, of course, lead to businesses, lead to startups, lead to economic activity. Well, the biggest transformational activities come from fundamental questions, not from things that a startup can do. Trust me, I funded startups, I've been in it. There's a really good niche for startups once we have these questions resolved. But the fundamental kind of rising the tide is fundamental questions. That's what we're about at NASA. That's what we're about. There's one question that really is having our attention right now. It's a scientific question. It's not a yes, no question. It's a question that has to do between investigating the universe from the physical side, the chemistry-based side, kind of moving over into the approach looking at the universe from the point of view of biology. And that's the question, searching for life elsewhere. As I said, just like discovering the secrets of the universe, this is a question that's also multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. In many ways, it's not clear in which disciplines the key answer is. But it's a question that I would argue is making the fastest progress of any question we're currently looking at. And it's one of those questions that humanity has asked for millennia in universities like this and others and beyond that. The third question is one that's really different in nature. It's just as important as the fundamental questions that I talked about, but it's very different in nature because of how it works. To explain it, let me talk about cancer research. Our lives, all of our lives, have been affected by cancer. We have a friend, we have a family member, a grandparent, that suffered from cancer. There are researchers in this university and in other places that do cancer research, and what they do is not standing by the bedside of a cancer patient. There are some of them that do that, clinical researchers. The most important progress of cancer research are people, are coming from people that stand in labs and shake bottles. 
They're out there doing theoretical investigations of proteins, how they fold, the 3D structure of these, how these proteins interact, and so forth. And it is therefore that application-driven fundamental research that is really generating tremendous value. Our objective here is protecting and improving life on Earth. It's like the others, cross-disciplinary. It's not just Earth science. There are subjects in planetary sciences and in heliophysics or in space physics that are very much aligned with that question, but they're really focusing that way. So it's not weather forecasting. There's other agencies for that, and that's great. It's understanding the science, the underlying science that will fundamentally improve long-term weather forecasting, will fundamentally improve our ability to predict hazards or disasters, will improve our understanding of space weather and how uh, space weather can be predicted in our environment or will, for the first time in history, not only tell us what the objects are that are hurling in space towards us, but help us mitigate those threats and get people out of harm's way. It's protecting and improving life on Earth, which is that application-motivated fundamental research has a different structure to it. The way we do it is differently. It's different, and it has tremendous uh, opportunity to have impact in the world right now. So those are the three things we're about. Another way of talking about it is by mission. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to uh, pick a few of them out. Those are the missions. And you see they're kind of organized by domains. You recognize that some of these missions are bold-faced. And uh, the bold-faced are the ones that have not launched yet. They're under development. The ones that are not bold-faced in regular fun uh, is a mission that, um, that uh, is in flight already. And you see there's Earth Science. 26 of them are in flight. Uh, another 20 plus are under development. By the way, the CubeSats and the small sets are not on there. Otherwise, it gets too cluttered. There's another 20, 30. Uh, but, uh, but then you have astrophysics up there to the left, uh, solar and uh, heliospheric, and you know, space physics, heliophysics as we refer to it, to the right. And then uh, you have uh, planetary sciences uh, at the bottom, with each one of them having an amazing story. By the way, who, does anybody find the mistake? Where's the mistake? All right. Graceful on is at the wrong font. It's flying. <laughs> the reason for that is the date is a month old. So it just, we actually just released three days ago the first data of that mission. And yesterday we locked up uh, the two spacecraft with lasers. Those are two spacecraft that fly next to each other at an accuracy of one micron. Uh, by the way, if you look at your hair, tear one out, look at it the, the skinny way, cut that in 10. That's the accuracy. So, so uh, the point is, there's a lot of investigations that are going on looking at these three questions in many different ways. Each one of those missions has a dedicated science team, people coming together, working. It's not a sport for individual performance only, quite frankly. It's all about building teams that lock arms and do kind of small versions of miracles. And that's what we're uh, talking about. And you already talked about this one, a miracle that's happening right now, uh, mostly in the UK. Yesterday, I looked at that spacecraft. Uh, we've seen in drawings. We've imagined in our dreams. But right now, I saw it. It's right there, standing in the middle with the engine. And the two walls that carry the space, the space instruments are standing left and right. The magnetic boom is on, uh, on the table. And the instruments are being integrated right now, a uh, short train ride, train ride away from here. Uh, by an amazing team, and I'm just really excited. Uh, we are going to, uh, at NASA, have the opportunity of launching that, uh, 2020 or so, and, uh, and we're really excited uh, for this to go forward. You already told uh, about our connection there and uh, how I personally care about this one going forward. There's one and a half U.S. instruments there, one with a U.S. PI and one uh, that we worked on, where Chris is the PI and uh, uh, Americans uh, are helping out. That's very common. Teams in science are always international. Science wants to be international. It's not one of those things that we lock into boxes. Whenever you lock science into a box, you lose. You lose. So that's why all the data that are, that are coming out of these missions we make public right away because we think that more people looking at it provide more science. That's why also we put in students right away here at the, uh, UCL, MSSL, and others uh, really to work on these exciting missions and be the first one to look at data uh, of our star, in this case, that we've never uh, seen. Of course, 
As we look at the shore uh, of the cosmic ocean, uh, one way to look at it is from our closest vantage point with solid ground. And actually, this is a picture that was not taken by an astronaut, by a, but by a spacecraft that's in orbit right now, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, that's basically flying over uh, the moon and is, is, in fact, providing the best reconnaissance of this, uh, uh, you know, our, our uh, moon. Uh, and, uh, and it's a really exciting mission because, uh, besides the fact that it teaches us a lot about the moon, really what we know about the moon, its resources, about uh, its structure, its, uh, its uh, overall um, you know, crater counts over time and so forth, we learned a large fraction of that we learn from this mission, as well as other missions that the international uh, community has done. There's something like five countries now, uh, either in orbit around the moon or on the way there. And so it's a great place to look at, at the Earth uh, as well. Uh, one of my favorite images from that is during the eclipse last year, we saw the shadow of the, uh, the moon kind of uh, going over the Earth uh, from the vantage point of the moon. So this is uh, uh, one of the uh, things I wanted to talk uh, to you about. And so basically what I wanted to do is, is uh, really recognize that as we go there, uh, really looking at, at the moon, of course, we recognize that that the space weather aspect, that, the, um, that uh, the radiation that comes from the solar environment actually both affect the surface of the moon, its composition, but also affect uh, the direct interaction uh, with, uh, with uh, humans that may be there uh, within a few years. And of course on Earth, we are protected by that. We have a magnetic field around that, a really complex structure, a magnetic field that's highly dynamic and a magnetic field that actually teaches us a lot about uh, a state of matter that's fundamentally different than what we are used to here, like where things are solid or gaseous. It's a charged gas, of course, in which kind of the, the, the gases are so hot that the electrons no longer be, know which ions they belong to, and so they behave like a fluid that are separate from another positive fluid made out of ions connected by fields, and it's this plasma that we seek to understand 99% of the universe, of the kind of universe made out of regular particles, not the dark stuff, the, the other stuff, is, out of, uh, is made out of, uh, of that in that state. And so we learn a lot about it, for example, um, with an investigation that's made out of uh, four identical spacecraft called uh, the Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission. So this is a, a mission that's right now in the tail side. So if you look at the sun, think of it exactly the opposite, that's where these four spacecraft are right now, flying in formation and really analyzing the processes, the microscopic processes that are there, for example, the processes in the tail. Now, when I went to school, like, you know, a few years ago, I told you when, late 90s, right? So the way we thought about this magnetosphere is more like in a static sense with some drawing. Well, the way we think of it now is more like that insert. It's a highly turbulent, process in which plasma and field gets transported, in which energy comes of that, out of that field where we don't really see it and gets put into the gas, the very gas that of course interacts, the particles that interact with our space environment and provide the space weather that are around us. Uh, there's recognitions, there's a paper in Nature in May this year that talks about that very process and the, and the fundamental fluid, kind of actually the kinetic process in which uh, the, 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 um, the reconnection works through an interchange in a way that we actually have not anticipated. It's that fundamental. Remember, re the, discovering the secrets of the universe means that. So in this, in this area, we can talk about other uh, of these secrets as I'm going, I will. But, it's, but uh, this is uh, one of the key uh, recognitions that we have. There's a new mission that uh, we seek to launch, uh, we tried to launch uh, actually three days from now and uh, we had to turn around the plane because we found something, there's a big rule in space and that is better to be on the ground than wishing you were in space than, than the reverse. So being in space wishing you were on the ground. So there's one of these control systems, uh, we talked about it, if you follow me on Twitter or anybody at NASA uh, like NASA overall or NASA science, you know uh, that uh, you know, one of the control systems uh, we're going to look at one more time just to make sure that this uh, rocket doesn't spin up. But this icon is actually looking at 
the interactions of these plasmas uh, at the very interface of the atmosphere, right at the top of the atmosphere where the airglow comes from. And you see it's kind of around 100 miles, 200 miles, um, that where the airglow comes from, and of course it's geographically distributed around uh, the region where we're going to observe it. Uh, the orbit is set precisely to be able to observe it and look at the processes that shape it. Those air glows, of course, are observed uh, from space, from where there are also observations of the high altitude regions, uh, the auroras, where there's a lot of uh, science that we're learning from as well right now uh, in a variety of ways through uh, observations that this team has worked on and others. I want to talk about one more aspect of this uh, science, and that has to do with citizen science. So this is uh, Aurora Sora. Some of you are perhaps already engaged in this. There's many other uh, citizen science projects. Those are science projects that are not just done by PhDs. See, science, there's nothing about science that says it's only important for PhDs. Quite the opposite. If science is only important for PhDs, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. Because if everything we do is inwards directed and we're basically not able to explain why we do what we do, the group that is excited about science becomes increasingly specialized and increasingly small in a way that it's very vulnerable. Citizen science like this one, organized by Liz McDonald, uh, one of our researchers, uh, is, is bringing together amateur observers at high altitude, at high, uh, uh, latitude, including in the UK, to observe auroras and bring them together in images such as that, and then bring together uh, recognitions that, uh, that these data in a way that actually helps us discover new things, uh, such as uh, an entirely new uh, type of um, aurora that was announced in March. It's called Steve, cool name. It stands for something, strong thermal emission velocity enhancements. But, you know, Steve, so kind of this, this was really discovered in part by citizen scientists. And, and by the way, this country, the UK, has a lot of history of that, of citizen science in the context of eclipses, citizen science in many ways across, of course, initially the empire, but also in the UK, right around here in England. So kind of let's go back and remember that and kind of figure out how we involve more people in science. And I just wanted to talk to you about that because I think it's so important, especially for you students, to recognize that uh, we have power to really spread science far beyond kind of the, the walls of your offices and the university and uh, really talk about the excitement that we see in science that motivates us every day to go to work and uh, why the kind of the, the excitement of discovery that uh, is really typical of science in a way that others can only imagine. All right, so we talked about the Earth a little bit. I want to uh, move over, kind of as we go deeper, kind of pull the camera back more and more and more. I want to talk about Mars and really focus on, in this case, one key question, and that is searching for life elsewhere. You remember, of course, the early drawings, uh, kind of early stage uh, drawings of Mars, the telescopes that are uh, were uh, discovered, and, and then uh, basically people talked about these channels and said, well, it looked like channels. There must be water there. And of course, they were really wrong. The first time we landed, we found, found it to be really dry. Frankly, we didn't know how to look. Well, everything changed, right? Uh, what we looked at right now, and this, uh, of course, is uh, the Crisp Crater. Uh, this is a picture released in 2015. You see a crater wall, and you see these gullies, these kind of streams that go down the crater wall, what we actually do see is that these, these patterns, they change over time. By the way, the scientists are arguing why. Uh, some people think that it's basically mud, uh, brine really, but that mud, uh, that they're going to find the sun hits it, it starts becoming more liquid and it starts going down, just like you're used to if you ever go into the Alps and look at a spring mountainside. But uh, uh, it could also be that it's an instability that is related to the sand itself, kind of the properties of the mechanical properties there. We're going to argue with each other. That's what science is about. It's not about everything being the truth. It's the search for the truth, which is much more exciting to me, because we can always ask questions. Every question is good 
to ask. Here are, uh, is a, an artistic version of this. You see these darkened uh, patterns. Those are uh, an artistic representation of images of these very gullies that basically show how they start going down, kind of a different image that really shows how these uh, patterns, so change that relates to weather, if you want, uh, on Mars that is very much evident on the surface change that we observe also from this particular vehicle. This is a little bit of a miracle uh, uh, that is there right now. It's a, it has a really terrible day today. Um, it's on sitting on Mars, and uh, uh, if you uh, watch the news, you basically realize that uh, Mars is forming right now one of its big dust storms. Remember the Martian? That type of dust storm, you know? So, so they're real, and it's, it's terrible. Actually, the mission opportunity that's also up there, which is solar-powered, is fighting for its life right now. So, of course, it's a super successful mission. If it never comes back to life after the storm, we're going to throw a party for everything it did. If it comes back, even more so, right? It's a 90-day mission that has been going on for many years. This one has a battery you see sitting there off to the back. That nuclear battery basically says that we're not dependent on the solar radiation. And so basically, uh, this uh, is going, it's a really dark sky uh, out there, uh, but it's going to be just fine and is waiting out the weather. Uh, this storm, by the way, as of, is forming, and as of uh, la late last week, it was around two-thirds of the environment of Mars, and it's closing out to be pretty much the whole kind of equatorial region, a dust storm of a magnitude that we don't have here. So it makes, uh, puts hurricanes to shame. So it's basically uh, a tremendous uh, activity. But uh, what I want to talk about now is the science that this, um, that this, uh, store, that this uh, rover is focusing on. It's really uh, searching uh, for life elsewhere. And of course, what you see here is uh, the Gale Crater. Like every once in a while, I want to trick the audience and put in a picture from, you know, Tenerife or from uh, Arizona. Right? I mean, you've been in regions like that. Mostly there's a, you know, you know there's a truck there or a, you know, a highway in the back. But, so you know it's the Earth. But other than that, can you really tell? I mean, obviously, your eyes immediately match and basically say, look, this is a dried out water body, right? It's a lake or a puddle. I don't know how to talk about it. Like if you go measure it, do some more science, it's 150 meters of water that was standing there. Right? And then how do we know, right? We actually have picked up samples, analyzed them, and the structures of these samples, the microstructures and, and the composition, the entire geology is exactly like, uh, these, uh, that, like these, this picture would imply. Yes, there was water. I already told you earlier in these crater walls, there's mud, we think, right now. By the way, from gamma ray images, we know there's a ton of water under the surface. But there uh, was water here on top of the surface. And, uh, and frankly, the water is not there anymore, so the question is why? Remember, I already talked to you about the fact that the space weather that Solar Orbit is going to look at, the plasma environment is really critical. It turns out for that question, it's also critical, and there's the spacecraft out there in orbit around uh, Mars uh, called MAVEN, and there's a science article that is precisely focused on that topic, and the answer is from the escape of Martian atmosphere right now, one metric ton per month, from that escape, we know from the mass dependence, from the rates, we know that over the history of Mars, close to 80% of the water escaped through that process. That's kind of a process we call scavenging, in which the solar wind comes there from the left and picks up what's in the atmosphere and carts it off into deep space. That's what's happening right now, and that's where most, much of the water went. And so that is a puzzle we basically think is resolved. So the planet, just like planet Earth, the planet that we're looking at next to us, besides understanding where they are in the universe and so forth, we need to recognize that not only seasonally, but also on a time set, geologic time scales, these planet changes. Mars looks a little bit like the one on the left right now. Well, it may have looked like the one on the right, much more a water world. Uh, than we recognize, even on the surface. So what happened during that time? How hard was it for Mars to create life during that time? How easy or hard is it 
if you have water in kind of the right thermal environment to create life. We don't know. It's something that we're focusing on. By the way, before uh, doing that, I want to just point out that, um, that there's some UK hardware on there too, uh, seismology type sensors, a French instrument standing on the gr ground there, and a German uh, uh, instrument uh, together with a lot of stuff. Uh, in the US, this uh, inside is on the way uh, to um, on the way to Mars right now, and it's going to arrive in November. So I hope you're going to watch the real life uh, broadcast of the landing. I'm going to be really, really, really nervous. See, the record of humanity land things on Mars is 40% success. So, so basically, most of the times we're failing. So I'm a little bit more confident because the ones that were successful were all Americans. So, so I have the teams that has done it before, but but the point is. Uh, it's always really, really hard. I look at the risks. People say we don't take risks. Trust me, we do, because I have to sign off on them. So, so basically, uh, we're, we're going out there uh, looking at this and uh, really looking at what's underneath. And kind of as we bring together the geologic history, the climate history, we start asking questions that relate to complex molecules like that. Now, I tell you, this is now, you know, none of your professors would say this is not possible. When I sat in benches like that in the late 90s, it was impossible to have this kind of stuff done at the surface of planets. It's just not possible. You know, you can calculate how likely it is for chemicals to form in this kind of ring, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, sulfur-based, you know, like the likelihood of that is really, really small. Well, there's that proof that there was life of the, on Earth when we find things like that. It's often in connection with life. No, there's other ways you can make that by itself. That is not a proof that there's life. But you see, we're pushing the boundary. We're pushing the boundary. With this announcement that just happened last week, with this announcement of this, uh, uh, this other announcement, like methane is going up and down by a factor of three. On Earth, when that happens, it's usually in the connection of life, like you know, cows and plants and others. But is that a proof of life on Mars? No, not by itself. But the way we make progress, is we're pushing the boundary, we're pushing the boundary. And kind of, you have to look at the large time scale. This is not a single hit type of golf. You know, it's not all home runs. We, we, we hit it, we hit it, we hit it. Sometimes we're entirely wrong. We start and have to go in an entirely different direction. This one looks really exciting. So if you haven't caught up on this, um, look at it. Well, we're working on the next rover. This is uh, Mars 2020, it's coming together. A lot of different uh, investigations, including from here, uh, in part, uh, that are uh, going to go there and really starting a return trip to Mars. So for the first time in the late 20s, we don't just want to go land on Mars. We want to do a first round trip to another planet. We've never done that. In this case, the only passengers will be samples because we want to bring the samples, the very samples that I just showed you, to the best um, places, uh, the best labs in the entire uh, uh, you know, to, of humanity, and those are not labs that are on some kind of rower. There are labs right here. So we're going to bring them back and spread them around the world so we can learn about this, really the sources the, of ancient life, the sources of complex chemicals that we are starting to uh, find. So we think that's the next revolution of understanding that will come from these samples as we bring them back. Okay, which world is that? Which planet, which moon? Just shout out. Close vicinity, not, not quite. Huh? No, not Europa. Say? No? It's Pluto. That's what you said. Sorry, you got it, man. It's Pluto. So, so basically, what, what's happening out there in Pluto, so, so first of all, when we went to Pluto, the problem was that every scientist, not every. Many scientists thought it's going to be really boring because it's this rock far away. And, you know, yes, it has some atmosphere, we know. But, you know, why spend a billion dollars to go see a rock that we could find, you know, in closer into the vicinity in some kind of asteroid belt or some comet? And, of course, uh, what we found is a world that is by far more exciting than anybody ever thought. You know, worlds that, you know, this is an image, by the way, it was released just recently, uh, kind of, of, you know, solar radiation, 
you know, reflecting in these lakes, uh, nitrogen atmosphere, you know, I mean, it's just absolutely stunning, uh, the worlds that are there, much of it still under investigation. And, and what's really critical is that uh, also there, the very processes that I talked to you about at the Earth and at Mars are also working and are stripping off atmosphere into the, the deep uh, heliosphere. And at the level that we can go and test these models that are there, the fundamental processes that are doing that uh, under investigation. It's that very uh, process that uh, through the, the way we flew around uh, Pluto are, are actually, uh, we can quantify and uh, that have been quantified to be uh, absolutely uh, critical and uh, for uh, the understanding of the atmosphere and uh, also for the understanding of the quantitative uh, processes that uh, in fact uh, do this kind of loss. In this case, the loss processes are about our orders of magnitude higher, one close to an order of magnitude higher than the loss process at Mars. So this is far away, but even there, uh, the process that interacts in the plasma process is absolutely uh, important. I'm going to pull the camera even more back and uh, I look at that bubble around us uh, that we re refer to as the heliosphere. Remember the sun is blowing at that solar wind? We talked about that. There's a certain time at which kind of the pressure in the galaxy is overwhelming, that pressure that's coming out, and that is kind of the shape, the scale, the spatial scale at which uh, the heliosphere uh, occurs. Now, the question is, what's the shape of that thing? Is it more like a big magnetosphere. By the way, that's how uh, the uh, shape uh, uh, it was referred to or we thought about uh, like it's on your right. Or is it more spherical? Right now the community is fighting about that. And, and frankly, it's not so clear which one is right. It's not a stupid idea to think about it as more spherical because there are data that actually make it feel a lot more likely that it's more spherical. And data that come from these distant messengers, energetic neutrals that are coming from that boundary region, that violent interaction region, coming up over many, many years of journey and are detected near Earth. And it's that these messengers, uh, these neutral atoms, also by the way on Cassini, uh, out there at Saturn, it's of course now plunged to death, but uh, about that, you know, sorry for your instrument. <laughs> <laughs> So, but, uh, but you know, up there also observations were done that were really critical for that understanding. I just want to tell you that we're actually investing a lot in this really understanding at uh, this, there's a mission that's going on right now uh, called IBEX looking at these uh, neutrals. So you see at the kilovolt uh, energy level and kind of look at the spatial distribution. I don't want to bore you with really talking about the exact physics, not because it's not exciting, it just takes a little bit of time to kind of dig in and tell you why it has to look like this. But the uh, point is, uh, you know, the magnetic field in the galaxies are really important and greedy. That's what the aficionados read out of this one. What we're doing, and we announced that last week, we're actually reinvesting in this field of research and we're uh, going to put like at the half a billion dollar level or so, create an investigation that's really bringing this, uh, this analysis over and above to what we know. We're going to bring it out of low Earth orbit to L1 uh, kind of up there, you know, a million miles towards the sun, and we can analyze that very boundary of the heliosphere. At the same time, we're going to have some in situ instruments that allow us to analyze the processes that really lead to, a, lead to acceleration of these particles, really bringing together the MMS and other investigations that are already up there, as well as solar orbiter uh, and, and so forth that are... Um, uh, looking at that acceleration, the very same kind of acceleration, a fundamental process uh, near the sun. I'm pulling the camera more back. And so this is one of these amazing stories that, uh, that is going on right now. And I tell you, for me, the story started in 1995. So I, you know, I, it was said that I grew up in Switzerland. What he didn't say is I grew up in the mountains. So my job, you know, students, you have the same job often. Some visitor comes and the professors are busy, so you have to go walk them around and show them whatever church they want to see or the guards. You know, I don't know what it might be here, but I had to take them to the mountains, the visitors. So, so I had this visitor who came back from a conference in Rome, never met the guy before, and he basically, he was so excited. He was American, 
So he walked in sandals in the mountains. I was really embarrassed. <laughs> it's a thing you don't want to do in Switzerland. But, uh. So what he did is he stopped everybody who walked in the mountains and said, guess what? We just discovered the first extrasolar planet. And that conference in Rome in 1995 was the first announcement of two planets. By the way, probably only half the community believed that uh, observation was correct. Those were two Swiss scientists that I knew, very humble people uh, that uh, were kind of winning the competition against a very aggressive group elsewhere, Berkeley. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, basically, uh, basically, what they had found are two planets that were kind of like Neptune-sized. And these planets were at distances of Mercury. Now, what happens? The reason I'm telling you that story a little bit longer is there's a really important lesson to it. What happens is there were so many theories that said that that's not possible. It cannot be that a heavy planet like Neptune is at distances of Mercury. Why is it not possible? The theories were all calibrated on one system, the solar system. The solar system is well organized. There's these terrestrial planets that are hanging in, hanging out on the inside, and then there's the heavy and gaseous ones on the outside and other, you know, Kuiper belt and, you know, rings, other elsewhere. Well, clearly that's how the world has to be. Well, no. The first planets, you know, killed a large, vast majority of these models. They were dying that day because it was not impossible in these models to accommodate these heavy planets on the inside. That was not the way accretion was supposed to work. By the way, a lot more models died in the meantime because of the fact that actually the most abundant planet in, in the galaxy so far are planets that we have none of here. Their size scales, their sizes are between the terrestrial planets and the gaseous planet, between the Earth and Neptune. We have none of those. They're the most abundant planets in the galaxy. So what's the, why are they telling you that story? See, when we talk about life, when we talk about questions that we only have one of, the n equals one problem, the challenge is that we expect to find what we already know. And sometimes that makes us blind to seeing what's actually there. It turns out that that observation that was announced in 1995 was preceded by decades by observations of others who never cared to look for heavier planets around stars. They never even looked. They had it in their data. The reason I'm telling you that, the students, what you bring to the table is you're not biased yet. <laughs> so it's good to learn from your professors. That's why you're here for. They're amazing people. But don't lose your independence too early. Because if you do that, you don't bring to the table what you're supposed to at one of the best universities in the world, where you are right now. You're supposed to ask questions that are not asked every day, right now. Because sometimes the, the discoveries are right out there where nobody's looking. When the Laser Happened is a book that Charlie Towns wrote, who is the uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, researcher who uh, was uh, awarded, among others, uh, with uh, the discovery of the laser. The way he talked about it, research is like a path. You walk down the path and you make the path longer, you keep going down the path. And he basically said, what research is about is standing still and turning over the rocks on the wayside and asking questions a little bit orthogonal that nobody has asked before. Because what he said in this case, that was the revolution that brought us, of course, a revolution of all of optics. Optics was one of the dead fields. Nobody wanted to work in optics because everything was known, except like these two little things with the stimulated emission that Einstein talked about. Nobody really understood what the, whether that mattered. Oh, does it ever matter? And it matters even more as we go forward. So anyway, that's my uh, talk about to this slide. This is, of course, the status as of uh, just end of last month. Uh, you, if you go to exoplanets.nasa.gov, it's being updated all the time. 
Uh, if everything goes like we planned with the spacecraft we just put out, TESS, uh, we're going to get another 20,000 in the next two, three years here. Just from that alone, in the meantime, uh, there's other investigations, both ground-based and space-based, that are going to be put together and are moving uh, forward. And uh, with that, we're not only learning about these other worlds, we're now learning about ours. Because what we learn is that actually the solar system is not this stable thing that has to be the way it is. It's in motion. We know now that these planets that are where they are right now, the outer planets, they moved. And there's important signatures of that in our solar system, signatures that were very much motivated by the death of the theories that happened in 1995, when uh, new worlds were found with very different parameters. I talked about tests. It's up there. We, we uh, put the first data out. Uh, I missed it by one day, uh, but uh, you know, so it's a, it's a SpaceX Falcon 9. You know, so we have the launches that we use in in uh, science are done by SpaceX. Uh, we hope uh, uh, Blue Origins will provide uh, launchers within just years, so we can use those too. And uh, we actually have uh, what we call venture class launchers right now. Uh, within two years, we'll have two companies, so we can do 150 kilograms to low Earth orbit. And so basically, uh, what it will do is opposed to uh, seeing uh, the Doppler shift, which is the way the first planets were discovered. It's, us, it's these small eclipses out there in deep in, in, the, in the galaxy of uh, stars. And then I already talked to you about that, and mainly that these mini Neptunes and super Earth are the most abundant of all of them. Yes, there are terrestrial type of planets. Yes, there are gaseous planets. But in the middle is a population we cannot really study in the solar system. We need to look at the galaxy uh, to see uh, populations that uh, make us think, make us uh, talk about the uh, populations of, of planets around other, uh, about other systems that have similar size, um, uh, similar number of planets interacting, some of them possibly in the habitable zone, just based on a primitive calculation which has nothing to do with reality. There's a lot that needs to be included in there, including induction uh, of magnetic fields, which turns out to be in some papers uh, uh, that just are coming out, an important process. There may be other processes out there you need to discover. This is a totally new field uh, that, that really uh, only the very small parts of this kind of as we get into the cosmic shores. Very small parts are known. The vast majority is covered by ignorance uh, still. Some of these planets that are out there have very similar densities and illumination as the Earth, uh, even though there's, their kind of parent star is very, very different. And so, so basically we're learning Every time you open up science or nature or whatever your favorite journal is, uh, you learn about this. And you learn about the fact that their environment is dominated by a star, a star that, of course, has critical characteristics that we're learning right here, a star that has activity, that activity that affects uh, these planets, life possibly there, but affects our lives. And of course, a star we can do visit in that just uh, near past, when I was there for the test launch, I, waited, I had to leave to go to another. I forgot what that. Anyway, I had to go somewhere else and, uh, and miss the test launch. But what I did see is the rocket coming out of the, the hangar, a Delta IV Heavy. It's currently the largest rocket that we have. It's the Delta IV Heavy that uh, is standing right there at the East Coast waiting for the spacecraft, the Parker Solar Probe. Parker is the first mission ever named after a living individual in NASA. Uh, the reason we did that is uh, uh, Eugene Parker is one of the most humble, mo most accomplished uh, people that I've ever met in science. A uh, person that when I was a professor, I invited him to come get a talk to a group like this. He basically said, introduce me as a guy who couldn't get a job. Tell about all these failures that I had, because the students need to know it's hard. This is the kind of guy I basically felt he needed it. The fact that he doesn't have a Nobel Prize says something about the Nobel process, not about him. And so basically, uh, so basically uh, we're really excited. It will be, uh, hopefully this uh, summer we're going to launch this. Uh, uh, it will be the first time a person is there with a name on there. He, of course, predicted that there is a solar wind, a supersonic solar wind that fills space around the sun and between the planet. Uh, I counted up. There's close to 15 missions that are out there, including MMS already showed, where he wrote the first or one of the most fundamental papers that related to it. 
he deserves that name up there. And I'm just really excited about that, uh, you know, lifetime of discovery and uh, education. There's a third uh, observation that has nothing to do with space in a direct sense, but with a ground-based observation, and it's in Hawaii. You want to go visit that. It's just beautiful. You know, there's clouds underneath you up there on the mountain, and it's going to be an observation of magnetic fields in the corona of that star, in the atmosphere of that star, the first observation of that kind. It's a four-meter mirror that is used for that with a obstruction to get the, get the solar light out so they can see this. And what that does, it sets up in solar physics a campaign that is historic. As I said, later this year we want to launch Parker Solar Probe. In 2020 or so, we're looking to launch Solar Orbiter. And uh, DKIS is going to come together in 2020. In 2020, you want to be around, focused on that, because I would predict that a lot of the theories that we had right now will die in 2020, or will get major challenges, because for the first time in history, they will be challenged with actual data, because we've never seen the plasma up close to the sun. We've never really seen the observations of the magnetic fields and some of the remote emissions in the high latitudes that solar orbiter will do. We've never seen the type of in situ data uh, at point 0.3 AU that Chris and his instrument will discover. And we'll never see it in the context of the important force field that's there in the corona. We have never observed the coronal magnetic field, which will come from DCAS. So I just wanted to make sure uh, this is on your radar, uh, those of you who are into this kind of science. So with this, what I'm going to do is read that quote to you. The surface of the Earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. On the shore, we've learned most of what we know. Recently, we've waded a little way out, maybe ankle deep, and the water seems inviting. I hope you feel the same way. Good luck with your careers, and I'm now open for questions. Thank you so much. So I'm told that they want you to use a microphone. Uh, if, it, if you're too impatient for that, I will repeat the question. So remember, I used to be a professor, so if there's no question, I'm going to ask, call on people. No, I'm just saying. Who would like to start? I will start, but as a non-student. I have one question about the exoplanets uh, missions. Uh, the ones you described, I believe, look at exoplanets which are a couple of tens of light years from the Earth. Uh, is there possibilities to look at exoplanets which are much further uh, in light years than the currents we're uh, looking at? And we have instruments or means to do that in the foreseeable future. I think what we're going to do also in this investigation is is kind of as technology goes forward, we're going to go deeper and deeper. Uh, one of the biggest uh, breakthroughs on this will come from W first, uh, which is, you know, we're having a political discussion about W first in the US, but it's looking increasingly positive. You saw the Senate markup yesterday, those policy aficionados among you. You know, it has looked really good for W first, fully funded there. Uh, we'll have that discussion, but uh, it's two and a half meter. Uh, uh, mirror with a really big field of view. So it's kind of the way I would talk about W first, it's bringing big data to astrophysics. So it's kind of the data funnels out the back is close to 100 times the Hubble Space Telescope. So, so we basically have a bit time resolution, uh, basically so and so many stars that we, we basically have the ability of go, going deeper and deeper, kind of just because of the stability of the sensors that we have and so forth. Uh, the other uh, thing that will help, of course, is James Webb, which is six and a half meter optic, uh, which will also do some of this. There's others, uh, both ground-based and space-based, that will uh, also have the chance of, of going at that. For the foreseeable future with the assets we have in space, the domain that you're talking about is going to be the primary domain, uh, just because of the fact of, that the mirrors have are the sizes they are. So, but, but uh, thanks for the question. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. And um, what would be your perspective on space debris? Do you think it, po it may pose a risk to future space exploration? The answer to your second question is yes. So I think it's a, it's a severe, it has the potential of becoming a severe problem. 
So right now, uh, space debris, which is what you're talking about, is basically limiting our operation in two domains. The first one is low Earth orbit, and the second one is geostationary orbit. Those are the orbits that have most uh, economic value, and also uh, other agencies and other interests uh, are mostly focused on that because of imaging or communication type of things. What's happening, though, uh, is both here in, the, in uh, Europe with Airbus, but also in two other locations uh, in the US, uh, there are uh, constellations being planned that are including uh, an aspirational number of close to 1,000 spacecraft. So where we are right now, if we just launch those, that would in many ways double the space debris count in low Earth orbit uh, in a significant fashion. If we, the way space debris works is it's kind of, the first number is never the relevant one. Because as things become uncontrolled in low Earth orbit, they start colliding with each other. And just like throwing cookies on the ground, there's a distribution of fragments. Each one of these fragments is a threat. So basically, with the 106 missions that we're dealing with, uh, close to 100 in, in orbit, you should know that on a regular basis, we have to move spacecraft out of the way. And so that's really a problem, especially uh, as we want to have access to that, that domain with uh, scientific investigations, but also with humans, because we want to fly through that domain or train in that domain, even if we want to go to deep space with humans. So it's something, it's an innovation challenge we need to uh, focus on. The first one is, uh, it has many facets. The first one is the policy one. Do we have the right policies? I would say the short answer is no. The second one is uh, really, and you know, kind of we have to launch our the right policy. By the way, without killing innovation, that to be good stewards of space. The second one is, what's the right way to detect those things, especially at increasingly small uh, dimensions? And the third one is how to mitigate it. You know, what's the vacuum cleaner we can put up there and get rid of it? Uh, so those are the three challenges that uh, several communities are working on. Many of these questions are asked internationally, but it's a it's a it's a real challenge that is increasing significantly in the next, uh, right now, in the next few years. Uh, it's obviously very good news that uh, GRACE is up there, the GRACE follow-on is up there and working. How do you see the future of Earth observation missions with NASA? Are they under threat? Future of Earth observation missions. Um, the budget in Earth observation, okay, so let me just say something that it's not making the news. I'll just say it straight out. The 2018 budget for science is the highest it has ever been in the history of NASA. Uh, you can go check the numbers. It's never been higher. So yes, there's noise in the system, big questions, but the budget of science is the highest it has ever been. The same is true with the budget of Earth observation. Uh, Earth observation budget is close to $2 billion right now. It's basically the same budget as the highest budget under the Obama administration. And it's basically a product of a government that has money, different parts that are working together, finding compromises. So what's the future of the Earth science budget? Right. So I, we're, we're, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, we're, we're working on close to 20 investigations. I selected two just this year alone already. Uh, there's more coming. And so basically, we just got the decadal survey at the strategy for the next 10 years uh, for Earth observations. It will take us a year or so to really analyze that. Uh, we believe that earth science, just like the other domains, is, an, is, is the kind of uh, science that we want to do internationally. We work really closely uh, with uh, ac across uh, many dif different uh, countries and agencies, including in the UK. And uh, we see a lot of uh, positive uh, opportunity there. Uh, right now, uh, we're really, uh, we, we are really, I mean, it's, it's a very positive outlook. I mean, just based on data, it's like, forget what I think. The data basically show you that, uh, that in the last two years, basically, your science has been very well supported. And I have no reason to believe that will, that will go the other way. So my question will be, if you're one of these students, you're back on the other side of the, of the, of the, uh, the podium here, and you were, you were starting again, which one of those missions would you be <laughs> most excited about and, and think, that's where I'm going to do my PhD? And where is at least you want me to say think. yours, right? <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know how to answer that, and it's not because I want to cop out. It's just, I mean, kind of the, 
I just really believe that, you know, I mean, look at earth science. You know, you just ask the question about earth science. Look at this important value of earth science, what we're learning right now. You know, five years ago, we didn't even know within a factor of two how much snow was falling in the Antarctic. We didn't know how to predict within, within factors of two how fast the ice melted. It turned out some of these things were actually way different than we expected. Like in the Arctic, ice is melting way faster than a normal, you know, I call it the ice in the Coke model, you know, the D M by DT equal constant, minus constant times M, that kind of thing. Simple model. It's not working that way. It's very heterogeneous. The water going through the cracks is hitting the, hitting the surface. It's, it's, it's creating a high pressure. It's very different type of science. So you look at this, you know, like how can you not see the importance of that, right? Then you turn over. I just talked about heliophysics a lot, mostly because of the, you know, of the experience we share. I think it's really exciting. You have to make it exciting, though. There's really reason, there's many places you could get lost by doing things that others have done a little bit better. That's not worth doing. That's not what PhDs are about. It's really by opening up that field, like heliophysics. You look at planetary, you know, you, you look at the, uh, you know, the, the Mars work that's going to happen here, both at, with, uh, you know, with ExoMars, uh, you know, the experiments on ExoMars are compelling. It's, I mean, it's just like, God, I mean, I looked at the model yesterday. If you have a chance, go visit, you know, Airbus. It's really great, you know. And then, you know, Mars 2020 with a sample return at the horizon. I mean, it's the best yet, right? It's not like it's not like it's almost as good as the past. It's an order of magnitude better than the past, you know. Like, I mean, to me, the, having samples from Mars with a geologic context will unlock so many questions in many different fields. I mean. I mean, so of course, you want to start a thesis tomorrow, recognize that it takes, you know, in 21 is when the data come in, and the 30s is when the samples come back. But the way careers are done is with a big story arc of the type that I talked to you about, right? It's, it's that. And then you look at astrophysics, right? Uh, what's really cool about astrophysics is the confluence of ground-based astrophysics and space-based. There's some of these telescopes that are going up that are looking at the very structure of the universe in a prop in a sense that you professor are working on you know and dark energy some dark matter investigations that are out there too that are the very question about the structure of the universe and the energy what the components are of the universe of which we only understand not five percent you know and and so for me like you want to be in a field where there are open questions like that that's where they give nobel prizes out right and so so for me it's that's kind of the, the overall issue that's there, the exoplanet story. I think, you know, I don't know. But the one thing about research, we're really bad at predicting success. Sometimes you hit a wall that is insurmountable, and sometimes we totally un underestimate. I would have never guessed that we are where we are right now in the search for life. It's a factor of 10 faster, or a factor of 5 faster than I predicted. Like, you know, it's kind of if you made me want to guess. It's just, it's just transformational. It could be, with, without being crazy, that the question of whether there is life elsewhere in the solar system is settled in 10, 15 years. It could be. I don't know whether it is, but it's not, a, it's not totally crazy. Totally not totally crazy. The one thing about Mars is there's a significant chance that we rediscover an early stage of our life because we share rocks with each other so much that life may have come from one to the other way. I don't know which one was first, but we're in a cosmic vicinity. We go look at Europa. I didn't talk about Europa or Enceladus or Titan. Find your favorite water world. It's different. You know, there's an entirely different life if there's life there. I don't know whether we're going to find that. So, so I see I can come up with a good pitch for any one of those domains. If I was in heliophysics, which is where my research is, I would focus on the inner heliosphere right now because that's where the cards are going to fall. I mean, it's just, I think it's right. It's also a lot of the, uh, a lot of the kind of science community that used to be the leaders, they're all kind of coming to the end of their careers. It's, it's time for new leadership there, you know, to really take new thought leadership, you know, and there's some new leaders that are already emerging. 
So it's a cool place. But I think you can make an argument in almost every domain. Sorry for the rambling answer. <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, so you actually just touched on this. But I was wondering what your thoughts are on expanding the search for life out to those IC satellites, places like Titan. Uh, yeah. So you know what? Uh, the one thing that I want to talk about is just quickly kind of the macroscopic view. When I did my PhD, I was in the same office as the guy who invented the mass spectrometer that flew on Rosetta. When they did that, they designed the mass spectrometer to basically to measure, to measure isotopic ratios with molecules that they had seen with Choro and so forth. Nobody, nobody <coughs> expected to find glycine. Frankly, if I took bets, if I was smart, I would be rich now, right? Because I would, I would have made money of everybody. Everybody would bet against the possibility of finding a basic building blocks that make you, you, a basic building block in some of the most primitive part of the solar system. We go forward, we look at other bodies. We look at dusts of comets. We have similar type of investigation. And we go forward on Mars. I think the excitement about Enceladus and Europa is just starting. You know, we uh, had a story. It's actually a funny story because it's so old. The data are so old. Back to my point. People just don't look at the data the right way. In Galileo data, somebody found a jet of water that came out of Europa and found it using the same technologies that were proven to be correct on Enceladus. And these data sat there in the archives for decades. And so basically what's exciting about that, of course, we're going to be in orbit around Europa in the mid-20s, late 20s. Don't know yet how fast we're going to go. Depends on the rocket. That's why it's all uncertain. If you take the fast bus, you know, it's like your train. Uh, if you take the fast uh, rocket, it's three years to get there. Otherwise, it's seven years or eight. And so basically, depending on what we take, it's uh, late 70s or you know, perhaps even a little bit into the 30s. So we're going to go there with mass spectrometry in which we're expecting these complex molecules. They're there. You know, I mean, are there shrimp flying out there? I doubt it. But I don't know. Like, we don't know, right? It's like, what is it that makes life? You know, what are we really learning? It's really pushing that boundary of ignorance. So that's another uh, domain. I talked about the exoplanets. The trick there is really to observe atmospheres, right? It's kind of uh, the trick there is. So we have two technologies that are there to observe atmosphere. One is called coronagraph. It's that, right? I'm covering the star to see the planet. Lose a lot of photons that way. The other one is called a star shade, which is kind of the, the you know, light as wave version of a star shade of a coronagraph. So it's kind of a flower petal looking thing that bends the light just the right way that there's a dark spot without losing photons. And there's a third way you haven't invented yet. These are all new inventions. You know, I think we have to discover how to do that so we can start investigating those atmospheres. I think the jury is out whether that is going to find the first real definitive you know, sign of life, like for of algal blooms. You know, like how would you find life on Earth? It's that way. The atmosphere changes because of life. Is it really definitive? Well, the first time you do it, no. So you have to, you have to push on it. But that's the third one. And then the fourth is actually what's happening in synthetic biology right now. I mean, kind of what's happening with our colleagues that are really exploring life on the fundamental level. There's a lot of progress being made there too, just about how the kind of that complex chemistry biology interface is something of investigation in this university and many others. I don't know anybody here, but any great university, they're working on that, right? And so, like this one. And so it basically gets a confluence. I don't know which domain is going to be the one that's first or one that we haven't figured out yet. But the progress in all of them is amazing. So, so for me, uh, what I'm doing, whatever the space ones are, I'm attacking all of them in parallel if I can. Because there's only three. If there were 10, it's hard because it's only three right now. Mars, water worlds, exoplanets. So we, can, we have a big enough program so we can do all three. 
so I don't have to choose. And the science community is, is doing that, it's basically supporting that. So that's how I look at it.